colleagues, Kate Bicknell, who has started a, a PhD on the Stanley family. She did a master's looking at the military activity of the earliest families, because the famous families are Thomas, or Thomas, the uh, husband of Margaret Beaufort at the time, the stepfather of Henry VII, and Sir William Stanley, uh, his brother, who are both deemed to be extremely important in the Battle of Bosworth, and the debate about them standing off. And for the master's thesis, she looked at the <coughs> earlier service from the late 14th century onwards. The Stanleys were extremely important, uh, both closely connected with Henry V as Prince of Wales, serving in Wales, and also with the household of Henry VI, serving on the coronation expedition in 1430. So, uh, uh, she is looking generally at uh, the, you know, the Stanleys, but for the Stanleys, as she's going to explain, there's some really unique sources, although coming back on the bus last night, uh, so we had, they had an Adam and Kate had a really interesting discussion about this. So, very interested, uh, Kate, to hear. I'm sure some colleagues will know about these ballads, uh, Rose of England, all these sorts of things connected with Bosworth, but uh, some really interesting things I need to find out about them. Thanks, Thanks. First of all, thank you everyone for sticking around. Um, <laughs> um, my paper today is based on the first chapter I'm working on for my PhD thesis. Um, so it's, it's a very enjoyable new frontier for myself. Um, over the course of history, a number of poems have been written in relation to the deeds of the Stanley family of Latham and Knowsley. These poems contribute to our knowledge of the battles and events which the Stanleys were involved in, and sometimes they were pivotal too. Many of these poems specifically discuss the events of Bosworth Field, where Thomas earned the title Earl of Derby. At a high point in the family's fortunes, commissioning works of literature which further laud the family's exploits is a fairly predictable PR tactic. These poems also serve as a literary image of the events of the battles in which the Stanleys were involved. They can show us what the poets thought happened during battles, some of which have been possibly found out by word of mouth. From a military history perspective, some of the poems have information on the tactics and weapons used, although how reliable that is, is remains to be seen. However, it's important to remember that these poems tell us what the poem heard or even imagined happened at these battles, and there's little evidence to suggest that any of the poets were actually present at any of the battles that we are talking about. First of all, in order to understand the poems themselves, a little history of the Stanleys is required. The lives of these Stanleys are particularly interesting to me. I could spend hours and hours <laughs> telling anecdotes of their various deeds and um, misdeeds. However, I'll try and be brief. The first Stanley mentioned here is Sir John. His deeds, as featured in the Stanley poem, make it surprising, frankly, that he's not more legendary. <laughs> he was apparently a king's champion against a French tawny champion and had a secret child with a sultan's daughter while in Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> the Stanley poem also places him in France on his way home from Turkey, having been there before, but unfortunately most of the French knights were too afraid to fight him. <laughs> Um, he's also placed in Robert Knowles's Chevrolet Chase. Knowles is specifically mentioned as somebody that Stanley finds appealing to go and join in France and does so on his way home from foreign exploits. It's the second Sir John Stanley who was apparently at Agincourt. According to the History of Parliament, he was present with a company of eight men and 24 archers. His military service was fairly minimal compared to his relatives, although he could be credited with consolidating a lot of the gains made by his predecessor and solidifying the control by the Stanleys of their locality. Both of these men achieved knighthoods, and Sir John Stanley II was a member of the Order of the Garter. Both Sir Johns also served as lieutenants in Ireland during their lifetimes, and they were also kings of man. Uh, Stanleys, despite being a relative unknown in general history, were quite powerful in their time. The Stanley family, after Sir John, F John I gained the Knowsley and Latham estates through marriage, gained traction in more political affairs, and Sir Thomas Stanley was created Baron Stanley in 1456, shortly after the Battle of St Albans in 1455, which, slightly unsurprisingly, the Stanleys were not at. Um, 
However, <laughs> I, I do believe that this was down to um, both time and geography, it being quite a long way to travel in two days to get there in time for the battle. Um, so I think they have an excuse. Um, the Stanleys were a powerful family in Cheshire and Lancashire, and their influence continued to grow with second Thomas Lord Stanley, who became the Earl of Derby after the Battle of Bosworth. His brother William was also present at Bosworth. However, in 1495, he apparently backed the Perkin Warbeck Rebellion and was executed for treason. One day I hope to be able to give a potential reason for this, because he seemed to be doing quite well under Henry VII, and um, to me it's quite a mystery as to how he would decide to back somebody who, um, particularly as Sean, um, I noticed in Sean's lecture, uh, there was an indenture for William Stanley going up to Scotland directly to fight the King of Scots, who was harbouring Burke and Warbeck. It seems a unusual turnaround, um, which I can't yet explain. These two brothers feature in Lady Bessie, Bosworth Field, The Rose of England and The Stanley Poem. They were certainly the most famous of these Stanleys, although later derbies went on to uh, fame through political action. In the next generation, Sir Edward Stanley's forces, notably many archers, which Cheshire was famed for, provided support which turned the balance of the Battle of Flodden for the English. For this, he was created Lord Mount Eagle. After the reforms of Henry VII's reign, the Stanley's power was less than before, but they were still very powerful. The research I'm undertaking into the Stanley families is thus far providing me with a fascinating insight into a fairly unknown family of characters who appear as minor and major roles throughout the 14th and 15th centuries. And so far, the greatest mystery I've encountered surrounding the Stanleys is why so little is widely known about them. Both at Bosworth Field and Flodden, they provided decisive action which turned the tide in their favour. And not only that, but the Earls of Derby <coughs> continue to exist in their nosley seat, though descended from the Bickerstaff line, which is a later branch, and have been important in many centuries of history. We had an Earl of Derby Prime Minister. Um, perhaps their only fame at the moment is that they have a safari park. <laughs> <laughs> the poems, which are relevant to the Stanley family, are shown here alongside the events they refer to. To refer to the Stanleys more generally, the Stanley poem and Sir John Butler... The Stanley poem is a biographical poem which extends along many generations of the family. However, it's significant the Stanleys maintained a tradition of appearing in poetry as it continued to cement their actions to posterity. Though how embellished those actions are is uh, up for debate. Sir John Butler is also a poem in the Stanley cycle which discusses the murder of John, Butley of, John Butler of Busey. The poem states that this was all planned by the Stanleys. I've found evidence of lawsuits so far between the Stanleys and the Butlers, though none yet refer to a murder. Um, and I hope to add this to my thesis, and there are some fascinating lawsuits to be seen. However, today I will focus upon those regarding Bosworth and Flodden. So Lady Bessie, Bosworth Field, the Rose of England, and the Flodden Field and Scottish Field poems. All of these poems in the Stanley Cycle provide information on various aspects of their activities in the 14th, 15th, and in the case of Flodden, early 16th centuries. Likewise, they broadly show some information, at the very least, on how the poets believed the battles were fought and won. They're obviously fiction garnished with fact, which makes them a dangerous source, because some of those fictions can seem quite plausible when uh, peppered with those facts. I intend in the near future to view the manuscript forms of each of these poems um, to get further information on their origins. However, at the moment, I haven't been able to do that. As such, my analysis of the poems is limited to the language and using historical facts to verify elements of the poems themselves. The main use of poems like these for the Stanley family was, of course, to make them look good. They serve as PR for the family and were potentially recited at family events or gatherings, though obviously I can't confirm that. It's unlikely, though, that these poems were written without the intention of performing them somewhere. No doubt there was some financial outlay in commissioning them, if they did, but they're unlikely to have been written for the Stanley family without some motive on the poet's part. <laughs> 
The extract here from manuscript B of Lady Bessie is the beginning of a list given by Elizabeth of the lands given to Lord Stanley by her family's good graces, as well as giving reference to the beneficial marriage arrangement between Stanley and Margaret Beaufort. This provides us with a useful family history narrative on the acquisitions of the Stanleys through the period, though actually the lands they had far surpassed the ones mentioned in this list, and so it's incomplete as an inventory. It would be possible to confirm some of the land grants using the sources available at the National Archives, um, and conveniently, um, I believe Michael Bennett has already done so. <laughs> um, it's been suggested that the poem was written by Humphrey <laughs> Brereton, who features heavily in the narrative of the poem. The poet does in fact shift occasionally from third to first person, particularly where he is talking about the deeds of Humphrey Brereton. <laughs> Um, we go from he went and did this and I was welcomed very, very well. Um, and so it's a plausible assumption that it was um, at least somebody in the household who was involved. There'd also be a viable motive for Brereton to write this in the service of the Stanley family himself to capitalise on their actions at Bosworth and claim some small part of the credit. Showing his patrons to be pillars of society would also reflect positively on his service. Though this is not proven and the date of composition is still very uncertain. If that were the case, though, that someone directly related to the events retold the story themselves, it would be an incredibly valuable source. It is, however, highly romanticised as a narrative and departs from established fact on a few points. Particularly, there is the battlefield marriage of Elizabeth and Henry, which we are certain did not occur until some months after the Battle of Bosworth. As a poem of a romantic bent, the poet has Lord Stanley assisting Elizabeth of York in foiling King Richard III's plan to marry her, establishing him as a villain in the process, and helping to return Elizabeth's love from over the sea, where he, Henry Tudor, was in exile. Likewise, the poem gives Lord Stanley the title Earl of Derby throughout, which is certainly not true, as the title was given by Henry Tudor after Bosworth. In manuscript B, Elizabeth specifically acts, asks for military aid. Quote, I want nothing but the strength of men and good captains two or three, end quote. Later saying, quote, let us raise with him to fight, end quote. Meaning that she fully intends to militarily take on Richard III. Stanley promises 20,000 eagles feet. Uh, his brother William promises 10,000 coats that shall be red. It's quite certain that the Stanley cohort together did not number 30,000 men. <laughs> Resap Thomas also features eventually as having 8,000 spears and Gilbert Talbot promising 10,000 dogs. These are references to the heraldic devices of the named men and it's certain that Henry Tudor's forces didn't number almost 50,000. Upon hearing of Henry Tudor's arrival at Shrewsbury, the poet then lists all the supporters of Richard III. It's a long list and includes one good William Harrington, presumably of Hornby Castle in, Les in Lancashire, with whom the Stanleys were often in feud. Interestingly, the Harrington also features later as the saviour of George Strange, Stanley's son, who was taken hostage by Richard III. Categorically, this poem places William Stanley well within the fight, and Thomas as far away as possible. He says, quote, I myself will hove on the hill, I say, the fair battle I will see. End quote. The battle itself isn't mentioned in great detail, but from Thomas's quoted intentions here to stay up on the hill and watch, um, it confirms a lot of historians' idea that he never even fought. Man manuscript H, um, another version of the Lady Bessie poem, interestingly details the head injuries inflicted on Richard III at the end of the Battle of Bosworth, which have since been proven by the discovery of his skeleton, which is a moderately interesting idea that somebody was aware of the injuries which he sustained at the battle. Moving on, Bosworth Field is of course one of the most well-known poems of the Stanley Cycle. It's also one that presents the most questions regarding the purpose of its composition, 
considering that it contains a 106-line list of the combatants fighting on the side of Richard III, one could surmise that it serves as a way of showing the feat achieved by Henry's forces in defeating such a worthy group of nobles and soldiers. Conversely, it could be a way of memorialising those who lost either their lives or their lands by fighting against Henry Tudor. There were a great many more mentioned in the poem than they're shown on this list, but it serves to highlight just a few of the names referenced by the poet. <coughs> Michael Bennett confirmed these names as accurate using the attainders sent out after the battle, and thus used this as evidence of the poem's contemporary date. However, I believe that, as Michael Bennett was able to do, it's also possible that a later antiquarian could have used the very same information to create this text, and therefore it's impossible to be certain of a date. I believe it's likely to be later, though, but as yet I can't put forward a comprehensive date. In terms of the information provided by the poem, I find it fascinating. As well as the list of combatants, it also shows what types of ordnance were supposedly used by King Richard III. Quote, they had seven scores sarpendines without doubt that locked and chained upon a row. As many bombards that were stout like blasts of thunder they did blow. End quote. On Henry's part, he is listed as having 10,000 more spikes and harquebusiers as well. Um, so quite um, the artillery storm, potentially. Um, it also comments upon the fact that Henry's army was severely outnumbered. Five miles compass no ground they see for armoured steeds and trapped men. But again, this is a poetic imagining of the, gra of the battle for the sake of drama, an incredible and close-run victory is far better than one which was obvious from the start, although Tudor victory was probably not obvious at the time. This poem has a slightly different spin on Thomas's lack of proximity to the battle. It suggests that originally Thomas had the vanguard and William had the rearguard, but Henry insisted upon taking the van, and therefore Thomas remained on the hill. <laughs> <laughs> so... Henry Tudor needed his chance, so Thomas politely declined to join in. <laughs> when Thomas's son George was sentenced to death, as with all the other poems which discuss Bosworth, a knight advises Richard III to hold off until after the battle, when potentially he can, he can then kill George, Thomas and William at the same time. <coughs> um, in Lady Bessie, this knight is named as William Harrington, though in this poem he remains unnamed. Bosworth Field gives us lots of interesting ideas about what may have happened. While we could dismiss it all as fiction, it can never be that simple. These poems may have got second or third hand information from reliable sources that we can never know about. So dismissing them completely would be as foolish as believing every word. This poem, The Rose of England, is contained within the collection of ballads of Francis James Child, therefore is also known as Child Ballad 166. Hales and Furnival, who published an edition of the poem, suggest that the author was from the northwest of England. They surmised that despite his apparent lack of talent for poetry, his enthusiasm for the Stanley shows him to be from their area of influence. The Bishop Percy folio suggests that it was written in the lifetime of Henry VIII, although based on the end of the poem in which William Stanley leads the heroic rearguard, it's possible it was written before his execution <coughs> in 1495, based on the idea that one would not necessarily want to laud the actions of someone who was then executed for treason. I think it's likely the poem is later than this date, but may have also served as a means of rehabilitating William Stanley's reputation in the eyes of later Tudor monarchs. As with the majority of poems in the Stanley cycle, it also depicts the Battle of Bosworth. The rose referred to throughout is Henry Tudor himself, and many of the other characters of the poem are referred to by their heraldic symbols. In the poem, the rose is uprooted from England by the boar, Richard III's most well-known symbol. Lord Thomas Stanley, who features heavily as per usual, is also known as the eagle, thanks to his heraldic device of the eagle and child, as seen on the garter plate of St George's Chapel, Windsor. The allegory surrounding Henry Tudor as the rose is seemingly forgotten partway through, as he is then referred to as the Earl of Richmond. The heraldic imagery is used throughout for most characters, the eagle, the talbot, the unicorn... Etc., uh, etc. Et in this way, it's actually easier to distinguish between the Stanleys, as so often they are referred to by their surname, but in this, they are referred to as the eagle and the heart's head. Contrary to the factors portrayed in other poems, this one suggests that Thomas took the field before his brother, 
Many historians dispute that he took the field at all, a fact which I suspect to be true. However, this poem, with its pro-Stanley author, most likely was used to garner a positive image of the Stanleys, within the narrative leading to the victory at Bosworth. The rose is given the crown by the eagle, and this poem reminds the descendants of that rose of that debt, though not in such a flagrant manner. The rose imagery has traditionally been associated with the Tudors, particularly the binding of the red and white roses of the dynasties of York and Lancaster. However, an early poem that suggests that the rose was already a symbol of monarchy, the poem The Rose of Rise, likely written in the mid-15th century and held within the London Thornton manuscript, says... Therefore, methinks the fleur de lis should worship the rose of rice, Mm -hmm. making allusions to the fleur de lis of France, a well-known royal symbol, being outclassed by the rose of England. Robert Thornton, the scribe of the manuscript, died in 1456, (coughs) well before the Tudor rose was established, let alone the Tudor dynasty. Thornton even predeceased the period from 1461 to 1485, when the rose was ubiquitous with Edward IV. However, it was clearly a symbol of royalty before it was appropriated by the Tudors. Firstly, I will admit here I am by no means an expert on the Battle of Flodden. Usually my, my research stops at the death of Thomas, Earl of Derby, in 1504. Of the two poems mentioned here, the first is Flodden Field. The first, as it centres more on the Stanleys. In fact, it talks of the report of the battle given to the king afterwards. A false report of Stanley's cowardice alongside his Cheshire and Lancashire men was given by the Earl of Surrey. The reason for this report, according to the poem, was that at King Richard's field, Stanley's uncle killed Surrey's father. As an interesting co- continuation of the feuds of the Wars of the Roses, except it had been over by this point, this shows some of the legacy left by the political infighting of the period. The grudge held by Surrey against Stanley is particularly interesting, and the mention that it was his uncle, William Stanley, not his father, who killed Surrey's father, again lends credence to the idea that William was the main Stanley involved in the Battle of Bosworth. Thomas simply gained from his relation to the king and stood as far away as possible from his brother's potential involvement with Perkin Warbeck. Scottish Field is a better account of the battle itself. According to it, once again the Stanley forces stood aloof from the battle, at great cost to other parts of the English army. When they were spotted by the King of Scots, he led an attack and was killed under the Stanley banner, causing the rout of the Scottish army. At the end of this poem, Surrey also takes credit for this victory, almost as though Flodden Field is a sequel to Scottish Field, discussing the aftermath and Stanley's hurt pride at false claims of his cowardice. However, as Scottish Field suggests, he stood apart from other forces, so the claims may have not been entirely false. He didn't run, nor did he leap into the fray. These poems, as a two-part piece, though probably not intended to be so, complement each other very well. Lastly, the Stanley poem was written in 1562, apparently by Thomas Stanley, Bishop of Sodor and Man. Thomas was the natural son of Lord Mount Eagle, who was immortalised in this poem and the other poems on Flodden Field. It's unsurprising that a natural son of the Stanleys would wish to lord his father's actions at Flodden and the previous generations. The poem itself is 63 pages long and consists of three fits or sections, the third on later generations being by far the largest. The poem talks about all the generations of the Stanleys and Le- Stanleys mentioned so far, and also Edward Stanley, Lord Mount Eagle, and his <coughs> brother James, Bishop of Ely. Whilst being very unspecific about places, dates or particular events, it does refer to some elements which are recognisable thanks to the poems. For example, particular mention of fighting the Scots and the refusal of the Lancashire and Cheshire men under Stanley command to flee. This rings with the poems of Scottish Field and Flodden Field, Likewise, this poem, perhaps to excuse what could be seen as regicide, paints Richard III as a monstrous villain in both form and deed. Quote, O Richard, Richard, what hast thereby won, so cruelly to kill thine own brother's son? End quote. Furthermore, it talks about the death of Lord Hastings and the attempted murder of Lord Stanley, who fortunately only sustains head injuries, before departing to eventually have his son taken as a hostage. An interesting later verse discusses the death of the same George Lord Strange, 
Apparently, he was poisoned at a banquet in the newly built London home of his family, Derby House, in 1503, just predeceasing his father by one year. He may have been buried nearby. The poem cites St Buttles. However, Burke's peerage has him buried in St James Garlic, Garlic Hythe. I've contacted St James in an attempt to confirm or refute this, and hopefully I'll find out more about the incident later on. Unfortunately, Derby House was ravaged in the Great Fire after being given to the College of Arms in 1555. So, without doubt, the Stanleys are a family full of mysteries to delve into. This poem, as a source of military history, is virtually useless. But as a tableau of how the Stanleys may have wanted to be seen, it's boundless. As with any celebrity biography, the truth has been garnished and embroidered so as to be almost recognisable as unrecognisable as truth at all. They are portrayed as adventurers, warriors and kingmakers. I would challenge anyone to read the Stanley poem and still not like the Stanleys even a little. <laughs> <laughs> However, even the ODNB article on Thomas Bishop of Sodor and Man, our author, states that the poem is of little authority. <laughs> in conclusion, each of the poems provides a varied and interesting image of the Stanleys. They may illuminate the image of the Stanleys, which they wanted to portray to the public, as in the Stanley poem, or show their impact in a specific event, as many of the poems manage to do. However, in the context of the battlefield ballad, they must be treated with caution. The peppering of facts which makes some of these, like the Ballad of Bosworth Field, sound plausible, will always disguise inaccuracy, as the poets were not present on the field. We only see into the mind of an author with these poems. They're not a means of seeing the true image of the battlefield, and so are of limited use for this purpose. Whether the facts are within them are reliable is, for the most part, less than likely. However, it could be said that one should put no more or less credence into a secondary source, simply because it's written in poem form. These poems should be seen for what they are, historical fiction. The popularity of the genre may even bring poems like this back into view as a source and as entertainment. Myself, I find them to be a valuable element of my study in the Stanley family and an immensely enjoyable picture of the imagined lives of those I aim to understand better. As such, I do hope to do much more research into the background and information given in the poems in the near future. And I look forward to looking into the Welsh praise poetry as a, as a, uh, as a source, having discussed it yesterday evening. Um, thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.